action! <laughs> Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Fax Studios. Uh, my name is Fabio Santos and this is Inside Filmmaking. Today, to celebrate its 10th anniversary, we're going to talk about with, uh, with some of the cast and crew behind R.V. Potter and the Ridiculous Premise. Hey guys! Hey everyone! Hey! Hey! hey how's it going? going? I personally cannot believe it's been 10 years since this movie was released. I still remember, and it feels like yesterday, when Tim first contacted me to be part of this film and do some VFX on it. So uh, to start things off, I'll, I'd like to uh, ask him how this movie was made. Like, what was it like mounting a production of this scale? What? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there was obviously a lot involved in this project. We, in a nutshell, we made sure we took our time planning it, preparing it, preparing the script. When we got done with Dork of the Rings, we knew we wanted to do this. So we spent about a year and a half on the script. And while we were writing the script, also planning all the costumes and the casting and everything. So we'd be ready to rock and roll. We shot it over a two month period in the summer of 2008, and, uh, mostly in the warehouse at Better World Books. We let us use that. And we had uh, Joe in, in from Florida and Sonny in from Reno and um, had to do it in a, a short window, probably about a 16 day shoot. And then another you know, year and a half or so, actually almost three years of post production. So we built all the set uh, walls and made them interchangeable. Had a, and we just really could not do it without you know, our amazing cast 50 speaking roles plus, you know almost 100 extras and then you know a great crew and then everyone chipping in you know the crew would help with sets i mean the crew would help with sets but also the cast would help with sets and building props and we just like build you know putting a having a train locomotive going and you're building the track in front of it and you know just everyone really came together and there's a lot of heart and dedication is what uh, helped us put it together in creativity So, so yeah, it must have been tough, and uh, but my next question goes to Michael, who's also a, a writer, so it's kind of a question for the both of you. Uh, it must have been tough uh, condensing seven books into one film. So how did you guys manage to pull that off? Oh, it was easy. What we did is we, we only got up to book six. We yet to have you know, the last book out. So we went to Ace Hardware and got, got, got ourselves a large device took all those six books and then started squeezing them together. Of course, that broke, went back to Ace for a larger device, squeezed that, and the third time, we finally were able to compress all those books into one. But it was difficult to read. Right, Tim? <laughs> sure, I mean, that, that basically makes as much sense as uh, what I remember. <laughs> there was a lot of squeezing, I mean, Harry Potter, Harry, Harry, Harry Potter, Potter is very fat, fat and he had to lose a lot of weight <laughs> while still looking like Harry Potter in terms of the story. And we did as many fan nods as we could everywhere. So. Right. Uh, but definitely went down a lot of roads that dead end and trying to make it happen. Right. And uh, while well, Jim was there. Yeah, I remember tables full of three by five cars that would get shuffled around in order to try and make sense out of it all. <laughs> it didn't work, but uh, you know, we tried. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was it's like it, one of my one of my favorite parts of the whole writing scene was when we finally came up with the idea that it would be kind of a postmodern situation where Harvey Potter is part of the book. I mean, that's at the core of this, and then of course the copyright is that kind of a thematic element that works throughout the whole thing. Um, so we had we had a couple guys. To be able to go along, right? Yeah, meta with the fandom and everything too. Yeah, the fandom, of course. Yeah, but um, we wrote it fairly. How long did it take us? Well, we, I mean, we had it done in about a year, and then kept polishing it. Right. Now the great thing, and the serendipitous thing, was that we didn't know the ending, so we went ahead and wrote an ending. Which is almost like the ending. <laughs> right, we didn't know the real one. Yeah. Modern. So it was, it was like, okay, we're like rocking with uh, rolling. Right, we used the muggle net, uh, what will happen in Harry Potter 7 as a guide for uh, guesses. Right. Yeah. So uh, 
and it was definitely a challenging but fun. I just remember us constantly laughing throughout the whole uh, process. Mm -hmm. And Jim, you slept. No, just kidding. A lot. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> Uh, my next question goes to Bryce Cohn, who uh, plays Harvey Butter. Was it difficult to find the right tone for the character? Uh, to find the right tone for the character? No, it was it was actually, was actually pretty, pretty fun because it was just like every every type of smart ass sort of person you could imagine. That's who Harvey was, and uh, I never got to play a character like that before, and it was really really cool to get to do it. So no, I just I I got to live out my dream. Let me say that. Just, just be mean to everyone. It was, it was great. <laughs> and I just want to interject. We, we did have some challenging uh, times trying to figure out how to make uh, the character in general not just be Harry Potter, but how to have a, a take on it. So we went with that kind of teenage uh, emo punk rocker kind of feel to it, uh, which Bryce took to. Yeah, and it helps that Bryce uh, is a music teacher and music is part of what he does, so the, the whole wizard rock thing just ended up working really well for the character and for the movie. Yeah, yeah and, and funny, funny enough, enough, I mean, at the, at the same, even, even at the same time, time I, think I think we were, we, we had, had a, a Quapple Kids, Kids performance coming up, up like around this time at, at a big, big Harry, Harry Potter convention in Chicago, Chicago Rock Chicago, Chicago, and then was it the Terminus, Terminus was that what it was called, the big, or whatever? Oh, no, no, it was, it was just LeakyCon, it was LeakyCon or something, I can't remember. Anyway, anyway so we, we had, had that going on during the exact same time as all this, so it was just really, really cool. cool. Sunny came, came there, uh, and, yeah. and uh, gosh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was just so, so much fun to be able to do all, all that subsequently, subsequently, and then the book came out, so the fandom at the time was just over the top, just crazy, excited, fun kind of stuff, so it was a blast. When we showed the at what was it, that where we... Infinitus. Infinitus, where we had to compete with uh, the um, state play. Right, the Harry Potter and right, other Harry Potter events. Yeah, the movie ended up uh, going to a lot of Harry Potter conventions, which, you know, there's uh, some merit to it. So uh, my next question goes to Sunny, now that we, uh, we spoke about her. Uh, how did you get involved in, in the project? I know it's quite a, an interesting story. You came all the way from Reno, so... How did you meet Tim, and what was it like when you first arrived? Well, as a funny story to mention, uh, Terminus, because I remember seeing them there, kind of in the background, and they were interviewing people, but I didn't meet them there. Um, I found out about the project later, I think, and um, obviously I was going to some Harry Potter convention, so I was a big fan. And I found out about auditions, and I filmed an audition for the Jimmy Gage role and turn it in. And then um, I think I was in Vegas for something Harry Potter related. And I remember driving home from Vegas on the way back to Reno and uh, getting the email that they were like, well, you were okay for Jimmy, but why don't you be turning it? And I was like crying. My friend was crying. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. And speaking of convention, conventions, I know there's uh, another convention, uh, another fandom that helped make this uh, movie, uh, you know, have, like a different take. And there's a really interesting character that you know came to be because of a convention. So uh, my next question goes to Kieran Shaw, and uh, You've been part of uh, Tim and Michael's uh, pre previous film, uh, Dark of the Rings, which is a parody of another, of another fandom, uh, Lord of the Rings, one that you've personally been a part of. So uh, how did you meet Tim and Michael? How did you guys meet and uh, what's the story behind that? Uh, we did uh, just very, very, very small convention in Seattle. And uh, Tim was a very nice guy. He was uh, very nice. Uh, me and my uh, manager came. I bumped into this crazy people, and uh, they convinced me to be in their uh, sign up of uh, the Dog of the Rings. And yeah, and it took Kieran, them a lot to convince me, though. Yeah, well, Kieran, I remember seeing you sitting there with Kid with your movie. That short was a really good short. 
I was very impressed with it. I went over there, and that's where I we yeah. began talking, and then, yeah. come on, Tim, you gotta meet this guy. <laughs> yep, yep, and uh, we met, yeah. We started joking, and things started happening. Yeah. Yeah. How do we know each other? God, how long? Uh, 2005. Uh, yeah. May of 2005. Wow. Tolcom in Seattle. Yep. Yeah. Long time. 15 years. Yep. Good to see you, my brother. <laughs> so then we, uh, oh, so then we, uh, it's nice to meet everyone there, seeing everyone there. Yeah, that was yeah. really nice. Uh, Karen was able to come over for. Uh, five to six days to be in Harvey Potter, um, which was really cool. We got to spend a lot of that time in blue paint. So. Yeah. And, and Karen, do you remember Sunny? Do you remember yeah, the you. acting lesson? We, uh, yes, yeah, I remember that. Never forget one hell of a evening, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <Good morning. laughs> it was, yeah. But I mean, I remember you and I going down and planning to sneak back in, uh, or uh, let's just say, uh, could start yeah. giving a little few acting tips to yeah. Sonny. You were doing great, Sonny, but you were blinking too much. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that was uh, 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 Oh, great. Yeah, it's uh, really great that you guys uh, you know, managed to uh, get all, all that experience and, uh, you know, connecting with uh, different people from all over the world. And in this case, Kieran flying all the way from London, you know, it's a, uh, I believe it, it, it was a great experience for uh, for all of you. So uh, my next question uh, goes to Rose, who played uh, the role of KJ uh, Bowling uh, in the final part of the film. And uh, my question for you, Rose, uh, what were the challenges of filming that finale in the in the library? Um, I think that my main challenge was the choreography and the fight scene, making it look um, realistic as possible um, was the biggest challenge that I had. It was just, it was really exciting, the whole experience, and I loved um, getting the chance to film with Kieran. That was um, really exciting, and him and all his blue paint, Ian Strainberg did a really good job of the blue paint. <laughs> Rose, that was kind of a late night, and we had to come back too, right? Oh yeah, that was, um, I think it was like two o'clock in the morning, yeah. if I remember correctly. <laughs> well, I, what I did is, um, I knew, because I was ADing there, I knew that we were gonna run out of time, so I went to the library heads. They said, you have the whole night if you want. And I said, I thought, if I said that to you guys, and not you especially, but Joe, <laughs> we'd be there all night. So I lied and said, we only got an hour. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You all being a proper AD now. <laughs> right. Uh, a movie uh, of this scale, uh, you know, being a, a Harry Potter uh, parody, uh, it involves a lot of people and a lot of costumes. And uh, one of the things that we really see when we watch the movie is the amount of costume design that went into making uh, the movie. So my next question goes to Janice, and it is, uh, you know, with over a hundred people appearing on screen, what was your like favorite costume from all of those, and the most challenging one as well? Okay. Oh gosh, that's hard to say. Um, I made quite a few of them. I think my favorite costume was for McGonagall because it was one of the more difficult ones to make. Um, what I ended up doing, because it had to be very form-fitting, was I, I got a bathing suit, a natural bathing suit, and I had no idea at the time who Madonna was. <laughs> and so I had to look her up and go, oh. So I saw the cone things and all this kind of stuff. So uh, I basically got, got the bathing suit. suit. I took my dress form and built it up to fit Mindy's sizes. And uh, the biggest challenge was it had a lot of little tucks in it, which is parallel sewing. 
So I did all of that and did the matching hat. And uh, actually, I, I think it came out uh, pretty well. Um, the other costume, I think my favorite one was, because it was such an interesting idea, was a potato chip bag for here. <laughs> How to make a big giant to potato chip bag and how to make it look nice and vinyl-y. So I finally thought, okay, I went to Joanne's. There's some vinyl. To make it look like vinyl, I'll make it out of vinyl. So that's what I did. And I told Tim, don't let him wear it too long and it gets really hot. And uh, I think it came out looking pretty good. Tim did the printouts for me. Uh, know the, the name and stuff like that, and uh, I constructed it out of different color fabrics and put the vinyl on top of it, and uh, came out, I think, uh, pretty decently. And Janice, the, Dumble, the Mumblemore costume also was uh, had a lot of significance as well, right, with uh, the, the uh, Gen Con and with, you know, Dave and everything. Um, right. Uh, that unfortunately was Dave's last film we got to do. I had been working with him um, on Thor of the Rings. I actually made some costumes for him personally because I made, uh, he liked to be a uh, Father Christmas, so I made him a Father Christmas costume. And we had gotten to be really good friends. And uh, that was the, actually the last costume I made for him. And it really came out well. I think most of that was Tim's idea. You had wanted it to put like a, a kitchen towel and different kinds of things like that on it. So I did that. And uh, I think it just looked really good on Dave. I had made a hat, the same, actually the exactly the same hat for him. So I just redid it in a different material. And uh, I was really pleased with the way it looked. I think Dave was too. Mm -hmm. And Janice, don't forget the acting part you had. That was oh, cool. yeah. yeah, I was a candy witch. witch. <laughs> <laughs> what was it well, like? Don't... <laughs> right. What was it that like was playing the part? It's like so delicious, we just wanted to eat you. <laughs> Actually, I still have the hat. I thought about wearing it, but then I realized it's supposed to rain today. I'm outdoors. Oh. <laughs> I decided to leave it at home. Melting candy. Yeah. I'd love that your reaction to looking at Madonna was, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of like, well, okay, you know, I'm not a little girl, but it's like, okay, I've never seen anything like that before. But then I started to see it's a challenge. <laughs> Let's see, Let's see if, if I can, can make, make that. that. Just, you know, like, like okay, okay, I got, I got a, a challenge. challenge. Let's, Let's go. go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, along with the uh, costuming, another uh, big part in a movie like this is sound. With all the special effects that happens uh, in the in the movie, uh, sound is a really important part of that. And we have Brian here that did not only the uh, production sound, recording all the dialogue and whatnot, but he also did all the post production. Uh, Doing all all of those, the foley mm -hmm. and uh, the special effects. So, what was it like, and uh, how did that onset experience uh, help you uh, with the post production and the sound design part of it afterwards? <laughs> That's a good, good question. question. Um, um, onset was, well, <laughs> if anything, being on set and then me doing, doing the post production was actually, was actually kind of good because. because I, I could I at least try and control the sound and the, and the noises, noises and stuff we were all making. making. Uh, on set to make my job a little easier in post-production, um, although I think I might have been a little unpopular at times when we were filming in that warehouse, and we would have all the fans going, and then it was time to go, and it's like, shut everything off! <laughs> but, you know, 110 degrees in there, and it's like, oh, come on! But, uh, yeah, that really helped uh, for me to be able to control the environment and stuff there on, uh, on set to be able to to then bring that into the, the post-production and stuff like that that made that job a whole lot easier, just trying to clean up the dialogue and, and make everybody audible uh, over everything else that was going on. So, And then lots and lots and lots of mixing of <laughs> different sounds in post and trying to come up with sounds for the, the characters um, uh, to try and have, you know, 
Harvey have his own kind of sound for his wand and his effects and stuff like that, and, you know, certain characters would, would try to customize things for them that would kind of uh, go with their character. So I think I did a lot of, I tried to do a lot of uh, guitar riffs or kind of things like that for, for Harvey's, like, wand effects and stuff like that, and threw that kind of stuff in there just to... Okay. Add to the character. <laughs> well, I, mean, Brian, I gotta say this: you really was the best sound you've ever had in all our previous movies. It's our ever will. No. All those were the days. <laughs> but thank you, Brian. You did a remarkable job. Well, thank you. I had a ton of fun doing that uh, the movie and stuff. It was it was a great time. That was a it was, it was a very, very fun, fun summer. summer. <laughs> we <laughs> laughed a lot on set. So yes, yeah. <laughs> like, like I, I, I think I brought up during the the, the, the scene, scene where you're getting into the into the ducts in, in the movie and stuff like that. I don't know how many takes we had to do on that because of Joe and uh, <laughs> <laughs> his goofing around. He was doing, but oh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then, like Joe like messed around and just made cameos. Yeah, I just love how Joe kept making Tim matter and matter when he did that stuff, though. That was the best part. <laughs> I remember you also got to be the, you were also the voice of the pimping hat, and you had a cameo of the uh, hot dog vendor. That's right, the, the monster book of monster muffins or whatever, I think. And I threw another couple of fewer voices here and there that I did as well for some of the other characters, or just Foley kind of sounds or whatever, ADR. <laughs> I remember the cricket. Somebody was oh. telling me that you got a cricket and you had to find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were using the, the shotgun mic to, mic to try and find the cricket in the warehouse. Oh, to try and locate right. where it was. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise we're grabbing crickets in the sound. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's and ingenious. And then we were on ADR. Remember on that evening we had to do the ADR? Yeah, we did. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was <laughs> <laughs> well, you had your, your costume, while it looked great, was noisy, so we had to ADR pretty much everything that you said, yes. <laughs> you did a great job, though, yeah. That was a fun evening. Well, you can't have a potato bag that doesn't crinkle. No, you just want to know. That's true. <laughs> I think that was the noisiest character. I won't play. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, my next question goes uh, to Stephen Bailey, uh, who played Weevil. Uh, what was your approach to that character? Uh, uh, be funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I think, man. Uh, I, I, I remember auditioning and kind of, you know, I was in my early 20s that long ago, 10 years ago, and uh, I kind of just, this was my first or second feature that I got to do. So it was still very new to me, so I, all I knew was like what I was doing in theater and acting classes and stuff. I remember talking to Tim about like, all right, full confession, I, I've not read the Harry Potter books. I haven't even seen all the movies. I've only seen the first three. So even How back dare then, you? I know, I'm sorry. I bet it was even worse. Like, everyone just, like, whoever was wa is watching right now, just shut it off after I said that. Uh, but, like, I remember going up to Tim and saying, well, what do you, what do we want to do with this? And, and uh, he had a, you know, he had this sketch of this character, and I liked it, and I just ran with it. And I remember just doing a lot of this. And then Tim would be like, "Yeah, this and that." So it was—it was mostly Tim. I mean, it has—it has very little to do with me. It was just me facilitating what he was seeing, and you know, just adding comedy where I, I saw a bit. But obviously, I would run the bit by Tim, and he got a pretty good, uh, you know, ear for his humor. So it's all him. Yeah. Uh, my next uh, question goes to uh, two of you. Uh, we, to uh, David and Daniel, you guys played the lackeys of Draco Mud Draco Mudfly. So uh, why don't yeah. you tell us about the infamous uh, underwear scene? Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> supposed to be a fart scene. I was involved in fixing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was like, like the day of, of it, 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 in the, the script, script. It was like, like this cloud of fart that 
we were supposed to be like farting, farting and controlling each other. And then <laughs> on the day of uh, Michael's, Michael's like, like, how do you guys, guys feel, feel about doing you? Going you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, um, okay. I was like, I was 27, so I was legal. <laughs> and it was I was 17, 17, so I was not. <laughs> yeah, well, I also had a nice It was almost yeah. like a Daniel Radcliffe <laughs> moment for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. 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 It was, uh, yeah, yeah. And it, so, so that's, that's why, why the, the shorts that, that I was wearing, wearing luckily I was wearing shorts, shorts that day. <laughs> <laughs> and. The, that's, that's why they really look kind of weird. weird they were like, like regular really shorts, shorts, and we're, we're trying, trying to make them look shorter. Uh, this is weird. <laughs> remember, remember, we were saying you guys look like the number 10. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. 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 I was looking. Yeah, I almost mooned at Tim's mom. Yeah, she was there the other day. Yeah, yeah, I, was, I, I ran, ran around the corner, corner and I was like, like oh, oh my god, god. Like, <laughs> like half, half naked, naked, so that was, that was fun. fun. <laughs> I always dreaded that it was going to be a farting scene. I had always known what it was, what we were planning on doing pretty much from the beginning. Yeah. So the, the, the farting, farting thing is news to me. Yeah, yeah. In, the in the original, original script, script, it was like a farting scene, so I didn't know if it was... so. Yeah, yeah, Daniel, we just made sure we hid the entire script, script from you throughout the season. Never. Whatever. We only had to do one or two lines of the entire script. And then everything else was ad libbed. Yeah. We did one script and then. Yeah. Well, you guys did it in the perfect world of Hardy. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. We did the character the Throbbit when you were the dweebs for that as well. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, you guys uh, were joined up again for the Throbbit, so, uh, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. You were there for that. Yeah, I was. I was. I also have that shirt, uh, Daniel. <laughs> Not right now, but, <laughs> but yeah. So my uh, my next question goes to, to Kevin. Uh, he not only uh, played a, a, a part in the a role in the film, but he also helped a lot during uh, during uh, production and pre-production. Uh, so, uh, you are not only an actor, but also have helped with the sets. And there, uh, oh, yeah. Tim Tim mentioned that he really loved how the sets looked and how they help the you know the movie feel real. You know those those landscapes. So, t- tell me more about about that, about the sets, and what was the process behind creating them and designing them. Well, well, I was, I was uh, pretty, pretty much a, you know, you know productionist, and I just, and I just took, took my lead from Jim, you know, whatever he told me to do, and uh, one, one of the things he, got, he gave me to do was to paint all the sets, and as you mentioned, they're, they're, they're pretty magnificent. magnificent. As a matter of fact, I remember what this really impressed me was uh, Karen, who, um, you know, I considered to be kind of an outsider outside of the group, came in and he just mentioned, I remember briefly, maybe it was in a... Uh, uh, something uh, behind the scenes or something about how incredible the sets, the sets look. I, I mean, I, I was just absolutely amazed and astounded by, by it. And, and, and the thing that was remarkable was the, when we introduced the camera, the, uh, they looked even better when you put a camera on, on them. And, uh, and, um, and it, it I thought, I thought the lighting, lighting in some of the scenes was 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 very very good, probably better than than, than anything uh, lighting that Tim had done before. And um, the other, other thing, thing that I did, I did is I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a utility, utility actor, actor, so you know I played I play Chris Mudfly, yeah. which for me was uh, kind of a, a challenge because um, I'm not used to playing uh, a very very evil. Uh, very serious, serious kind of character, character because I'm usually I, I, I consider myself a more of a comedic actor. So, so, so uh, yeah. yeah. And then you know I had other uh, minor roles in it which don't usually involve lines. You know I think I was the. Uh, am I thinking of a throbbing where I was a uh, like a railroad conductor or was that my name? No, you were. Yeah, you were the yeah. train. All of yeah, the train. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. Um, 
And you yeah. were great, Kevin, Kevin remember? remember? We, we faced, faced down the ghosts at Potawatomi Zoo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another story. <laughs> that was a very interesting story. That was the, probably the closest. I've always had an interest in uh, the paranormal and ghosts, and uh, that, I believe, is the closest that I ever really actually came to uh, experience a ghost and the way that it went down, because I suspect that this ghost, in the end, was extremely mischievous, because it did not swear that, I swear that day when we got to load up at the end of the day, that somebody got in the back seat. We thought it was Jeff Martin. Yeah, Jeff Martin, which I thought was Jeff Martin. And then um, <laughs> the door closed, and I did one of these things like in a movie where both, you know, Michael was in the driver's seat and I was in the passenger's side. I looked at him and I turned over and said, There's nobody in the back. And there was nobody back there. There was nobody near the car. And I got goosebumps now. Just, you know, remember everything. Remember him looking in the, Michael looking in the rear view mirror. <laughs> 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 To wrap up this first round uh, of questions, uh, my next one goes to uh, Jim. Uh, he worked on all the VFX and with such a uh, VFX in, uh, intense movie and on such a, a small budget. What, uh, tell tell us more about how it was doing all the all the effects for for the film and organizing all the VFX artists. I was one of them. Uh, tell me more about the uh, the process. Well, I'm gonna actually have to throw some of that uh, actually. Uh, Fair amount of that back to Tim again. As far as all the spells are concerned, uh, Tim did you know over a hundred of those. Uh, he can give you the exact number, I assume. Um, I did uh, mostly the uh, uh, 3D effects, the, the squidditch match, and, and that kind of thing, uh, making models for those. And, and uh, then when the little girl gets turned into a a creature at the end, I did uh, and a little bit of animation on that. That was just a 2D shot, and we went in and kind of moved the bits around and added some high movement uh, to bring that to life. Otherwise, it would have been just a static shot. Um, uh, Tim, you mentioned the elderberry wand, uh, the elderberry wand earlier, and I have forgotten now who did that. that was that you, Bob? That was yeah, I think, yeah, I think I did that one, the gl glowing part of the one or something like that. Yes, yeah, in the box. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it took a little bit of rotoscoping and stuff like that. And I, I do remember, I think you all you did most of the rotoscoping for the uh, Quidditch match, wasn't it? Yes, and also for the um, the Jolly Green Giant character, uh, yeah. where everybody was standing in front of that giant foot. That was a that was a job <laughs> because it, it was just shot out in the park and all the background, we didn't have a clean background plate. And so everything had to be rotoscoped and then sized. It was a, it was a bit of a challenge and I'm not um, that experienced uh, a VFX person. So there was a lot of experimentation and trying to get things to work with minimal knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, and with the tools that we have now, uh, a lot of those uh, most challenging parts will be uh, pretty easy or easier. Uh, I remember like we were doing some rotoscoping, and like one one year after uh, we finished the movie, I think they came up with a auto rotoscoping feature kind of thing. So, well, now you have that out there. So, <laughs> it's always when uh, when you need it that it's not there. So, uh, my next question goes to uh, all of you, and uh, it's a more uh, general one. What was it like watching the film 10 years later? What was the experience? Uh, how did you feel? Well, to be honest, the, yeah, the thing, thing I loved the most about rewatching it was as you're, as you're seeing certain scenes, you're like, okay, that happened while we were shooting this. And even in the chat, like we're talking back and forth to each other. I think uh, Brian brought up the fun dip and everything. And I mean, that I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that stuff happened. I forgot about that. So that, that was the best part of rewatching it. I'd have to say kind of the same thing. It was just bringing back all the memories of, 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 of making the movie. That was just so much fun. And all the stuff that you don't see that was actually, that we actually did, which was just a blast. Yeah, I had fun. It was really good, uh, you know, to have those mem memories. 
coming back. But that was Do you remember, Carrie? I, I think we were all at Tim's house doing fireworks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was next to you. I was yeah, I was next to you. Hit by one, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, we started shooting yeah. fireworks at our fourth. Yeah, that's where you are, remember? Fourth of July. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, we see I see that's a tradition. I remember uh, being there for the Trobit. We also had some fireworks the Fourth of July. So I guess in every movie he shoots, when it when it comes to the summer and it's Fourth of July, you can count on Tim's fireworks, and <laughs> it's quite a show. Yeah, old leg uh, making it somewhat nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy. I've seen the film probably far more than anyone here. Yeah, um, but it's been a, a little bit of a while, and I definitely haven't watched it with all of you in forever, probably 10 years, you know, so I just, again, like Rice was saying, just enjoying it with people, everyone involved, uh, and kind of just going back to those memories and kind of uh, looking at things that, uh, you know, how has the film stood the test of time, you know, from 10 years ago to what we do today, you know, what would we do differently, and you know, you're always hypercritical of how it's how when you're working on it, but you just get through it. And I, I think it still holds up overall. You know, I mean, anything that I had complaints about, then I would maybe still, you know, you know, it's like what it is. But it's, uh, I think it looks pretty good, especially considering it was pre HD. You know, or at least just coming out at that time. We were still shooting on mini DV and with the number of green screen and other special effects. Uh, I think, I think it's so fun. fun. I think it speaks to that the, you know, the performances and the sets and everything. You know, as long as you can see the people well and you can uh, hear them well, you know, you, you've got a you know that's that's a plus for a, a low budget movie. Um, so I think, I think most people who see it are outside of the group are pretty impressed with how it was made for so little. You know, I mean, it is a it is like a an uber fan film. There's nothing like it. All right. I gotta admit, I mean, it really, really was all about collaboration with every one of you and those who are not here with us. I mean, what an incredible group effort. Everyone, I mean, I applaud you all. Seriously. But watching it again, I'm sorry, yeah. but watching it again, I forgot about all the puns. <laughs> Definitely. When I think about this movie, it's just like, it's such a, because it was all so handmade, I mean, it, it just, it becomes something very special. And it's, um, like you said, Tim, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like this one. Nothing I've, nothing I've worked on has been this like handmade with, you know, all original costumes, all original props and things like that. And, and so many people, like you said, coming together in our tiny little town of South Bend to make a feature film that, has been seen all over the world. I mean, uh, you know, for me to have that be one of my first uh, opportunities, you know, it's, it's got, got me here. So, you know, I'm, I'm just thankful to be part of it. You know, um, the, oh, yeah, the, I, I think the, uh, the movie, when I revisit these uh, Tim's videos, I, I'm not on there yet, so I'm coming back. Um, they grow on you like a fine wine. <laughs> or, or a fine pump. Yeah. <laughs> or a boil. But anyway. <laughs> so, uh, do you guys have any projects that you are you have looking at, you're working on uh, right now? I might start with Tim. Tim. What's that? Uh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. Oh, okay. Do you have any projects that you're work, working on and something you want to talk to us about? Oh, sure. I thought you were asking generally to everyone, do they have projects going on? Um, yeah, so um, we're currently working uh, in production for Dr. Spiderwax Mind Modeling Compendium of Fantastic Urban Beasts. Which I still can't remember. Right <laughs> years, we started shooting last summer. Um, had some you know challenges to you know completing it, including the warehouse burning down that we were filming yeah. at. Not while I mean not while we were filming, fortunately, the day before while we were setting up. So that was pretty devastating for our friend that uh, Vic at Fun Effects, whose building it was, 
and a big supporter of our projects, but also, you know, our film, we were able to, fortunately, our, most of our stuff turned out to be okay in that fire fight. Totally a miracle. Um, so our puppets and a lot of our things. Um, but anyway, so we're working on that and we'll continue as best we can this summer as well, um, given that we have, you know, yet another obstacle with um, COVID and everything. But uh, again, it's that dedicated cast and crew and a lot of the same people who were in Harvey Potter are still working on this project. In fact, the Harvey Potter world is part of the world of our Dr. spider man movie that we have. Scooby Doo Mander that Daniel's playing, uh, Bryce is playing um, uh, Jareth, and his, and his references, references to Harvey Putter in it, and uh, we'll have a yeah, we'll have, we'll have a cameo. Michael's, Michael's back as Zoophilius. Uh, one cat. We have a Lou. Uh, we have her. We renamed her. She's Luma. 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 Yum. Luma. Lump good. I think is that what we call it. I never have it. We only wrote it. Playing a version of her. So yeah. So. Kind of revisiting that fantasy magic world. The one difference is a lot of it's being shot in the real world. Um, so there are some challenges to that because we're not in a controlled set that we, we built. Um, and just glad to have the Kieran's in it. He's playing the lawn gnome. Yep. Oh, you look perfect. We already shot some stuff with him, even though he wasn't here. We, we made a mannequin of Kieran. <laughs> out space, literally on a printer, put it on the mannequin, put the wig on it and the hat. So you've got like, so that we have shots of the house from a distance, you've got shots of Cure in there, and then we'll superimpose his face or cut it here. And yeah, so you've been. You don't, you don't get, get paid, paid for that, that part, Kira, just so you know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 the stunt <laughs> double, have a stunt <laughs> double, uh, scale <laughs> double, so. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so it's great having you, having a sort of you on set already. So we're hoping that will come out in a year or so, you know, just with everything going on. And I, and I do, do know, know Fabio, I did see a question, question in the uh, the chat room too. Yep, that I'm gonna to jump off to that. Uh, <clears throat> Trisha asked a couple minutes a minutes ago, actually, uh, how many rewrites were there for uh, for Harvey Potter? Oh my god. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it was like right before shooting. Uh, right. Right. Well, Michael, <laughs> Michael just always thought there were too many like poop jokes in there, so he, would, anytime a scene came up, he was like, "Oh no, there's a poop joke. We got to get rid of this. Come up with something else." Hey, and Tim would go, "What?" Yeah, because I particularly, you know, we need together work on the script. And then I could fine tune it, um, and then I'd show up with my mind of what the scene would have, and then they'd, uh, I'd be setting up a shot, and the actors would come on set, and I'm like, who wrote this? What did we need the line? Like, Michael and them rewrote it out of the parking lot, and then gave that. Okay, whatever. Wow. Uh, Trisha had another question. She wants to know your favorite memories when you were working on this film. And it's a question for everyone, so feel free to, well, feel free to jump in. Well, mine was a Having fun, working on a very small, small budget movie was really good. And it was really good fun. Everybody was doing everything in it, rather than specific people doing specific jobs. Because this is like everybody was working in and doing everything. And I had really good memories of that. I had fun doing that. Great. Great. This is a man who is on the set of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the. Uh, I just love the camaraderie. That's kind of like a big general memory, I guess. I mean, there was just getting to hang out with everyone, not just on the set, but we would hang out off set. Um, and and too, the when Kieran came to visit, I remember uh, one night we just went back to his hotel room and we just hung out the entire night and. 
I drove Ian, Ian home at like 6 a.m. And for someone like me who is such a prude, staying up that late was a huge deal. But I mean, come on, it's freaking Kieran Shaw. And he's like, you got to hang out with this dude. He's, it, it was a blast. Well, you came up with me. You're probably just with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then and Sonny, Sonny was there, there too, and oh my gosh, I mean, the Sonny, oh, I, I, couldn't I couldn't believe it. it. I, mean, I mean, that, that, that just put it over the top. top. I, think I think Michael, Michael was there too, too but, but no one cares about Michael, Michael so. Hey! hey. <laughs> You're the one that took my <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'd like to take, take a moment and do a shout out to Ian, who me and home at Stanford, and he did excellent special effects. Uh, he's, uh, quite, quite accomplished, accomplished, and he did the snooze as well. Didn't so, he do the pimping hat? Yes, yeah, I believe he did. He built a pimping hat, and he made the lunchbox of secrets puppets. Um, he helped keep pure and blue. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and everything else blue. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of amazing memories. Of, uh, like, it was like one of the best numbers of my life, but my favorite memory was like night one, I think it was Bryce's birthday, and we were doing the first scene in the, in the loo. It was either your birthday or the day before your birthday. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because it was around Memorial Day, and my birthday's usually around Memorial Day. Yeah, it's actually right around 10 years today we started shooting. Yeah, oh my gosh. And I had never really, I'd never, I'd act, I'd never on film. And I had learned all my lines. And I just remember Bryce and Joe laughing at me that I had learned my lines. And they were like, yeah, you're not going to beat this. And they were right. <laughs> well, and Joe Chemelhut wasn't able to join us. He plays Rod Cheesley. He's down in Florida spending the day kayaking with his son. And uh, yeah, Rod Cheesley has a child. Dying his hair, dying his hair red in my kitchen too for that. Oh, I did that. I think what I remember the, the best was I drove up where we did the scene uh, where the guy appears in the toilet. Oh yeah. <laughs> you think it looks funny on the screen? If you were standing back there watching. It was, it was like, like this toilet, toilet up on blocks with his, his body, body sticking <laughs> out like on the floor. <laughs> I was there the whole time going, you know, <laughs> trying not to laugh. <laughs> with quiet. Uh, that made my day. That took a lot of logistics. <laughs> <laughs> There were lots of times even running the sound, I kind of tried not to laugh at, at these guys as they were doing their stuff. It was so funny. The, the three mains were just a lot of fun together. And God, the stuff that we come up with. <laughs> we sit there on camera going, I can't laugh because I'm doing the sound. <laughs> uh, I was 22 at the time, so I was just trying to like not be hung over on set, probably. Uh, but, uh, I remember, I remember the spitting scene. Uh, the spitting scene stuck out to me because I'm like germophobic and whatnot. So having oh, I love that scene. It was, uh, it was terrifying. It was traumatic. Uh, I, I thought it was hilarious because. When, you, when someone spits in someone else's face, it's gross, but it is hilarious. So I thought it was funny. I just didn't want to be it on. You didn't want to be it I know. No, we're just kidding. Also, oh, yeah. Jim Hall was unable to join us today who relays Professor, Professor Snake. He has lousy Wi Fi apparently in Bremen. Damn it. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he would tell you how much he had fun on the set and he said hello to everyone. And, uh, they said, said he's got a cameo in the, the current movie coming, coming up. up. Uh, we'll shoot. So Professor, Professor Snake, Snake will be back. The wig and the costume still exist. Yes, there's Go ahead. Go ahead. There was so many, um, so many really good memories associated with this. And probably what you might be able to detect from the conversations is that we're all very... I consider, I consider myself, myself very, very close in personal friendships with a lot of people. And, and, and maybe, maybe maybe when you watch it, you see that, but there's a certain, there's a, just a, a, a wonderful chemistry of these people. And it was, it was just terrific how it all came together, you know, in this uh, 
you know, with with Harvey 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 and and um, I, I, I consider, consider you know one of the greatest uh, moments in my life. I mean, I never worked so hard at something, and wow, you know, the end product was very good. Paul, thought a comment, question on uh, if anybody remembers the moo cow scenes and the underwear oh, yeah. and some of the cheese that happened with that. <laughs> In my bra. <laughs> <laughs> I had a ton in my bra too, Sonny. <laughs> yeah, the moon cars were great. Uh, I remember we filmed that till we probably was shooting in the summer. I mean, the weather's nice here in Indiana, but the sun doesn't go down to quite late, so we were up shooting in my backwoods for like 4 a.m. And I know the very next day, we were supposed to be shooting the Kung Apollo as the Kung Kwan Fu Master here at my house and all the extras showed up and then it was raining. And so then we went all the way over to the set or we are getting ready to go, we are like, well, we'll have to shoot this on set. But we had spent all week making it into the common room. Uh, and, and so, so we, we suddenly had to turn it into the room of, re, you know, room of, room of our requirement. version, the room of requirement. So I remember calling them, and while they took the photos, Jim, I remember you, you, you took the photos of the whole set so we could put it back together the right way. We didn't move the walls, but we had to make it look like a different room, and it was amazing. Uh, we put up these fake, you know, we cut up cardboard and made it look like boarded up windows and threw sheets on things. and. Suddenly we had another room and we shot the room of desirement and then took all that apart and put uh, put the common room back together. <laughs> that kind of helps answer uh, Ernst's question about the planning for the awkward school set and how long did it take to prepare for that and build all that. So yeah, yeah the challenge of that was that we did not have a location when we started building it. So oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Working, Working at Better World Books, books within, within a month, month I was introduced to this big empty, empty warehouse they had, and I went, ooh, I this would be great, great for a set. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> what your original idea was, because we were so desperate, was to build a tent. Yeah, yeah that came <laughs> later. At first, we were like, like, hey, you might be able to use this, but we haven't bought this, you know, we haven't leased it yet. So we were basically in the meantime waiting and hoping that, that they would acquire, go through the process of you know, finishing and actually leasing that other warehouse they had. In the meantime, I had to be coming up with plan B when one was like, yeah, building a giant tent, tented, you know, I mean, what else yeah, we, we were building 12 foot tall set pieces with no place for them to go. Yeah, we were building about my, uh, in my, my driveway, driveway covering them with tarps, tarps at night uh, for, for the, the set walls because and just hoping there would be a place for them to go. And in, in fact, fact, since the place wasn't ready yet, yet and because, because Dave, who played um, Mumblebore, had hurt his foot, we pushed the warehouse uh, into your snogboard scenes ahead of a week, which gave us the opportunity. We shot the entire train scene in my driveway and in my garage. Um, so. Immediately, Immediately, I found out we could get the warehouse. We were able to, um, that very next Sunday, I know, we, we after that first day of shooting in my garage, we shot till late, you know, early in the morning. Next day, we were hauling all the set walls over to the warehouse, and we had just one week to get everything constructed and ready for one of the biggest scenes in the movie, which, which was the great hall scene, with, you know, dozens of extras and having that whole thing ready to go. So all week, we were working on polishing that and getting all the final screws in and costumes over there. I mean, it was, uh, for you, could not have been done if you didn't have the amazing people that you know, were working with you were just of a singular mind of making this happen. Literally, every, everyone helped, whether they were an actor or not, like I said, you know, screwing in screws and doing whatever you could to, to make it happen. One of the things about sets with people who are you know, just getting started on this is that uh, we didn't know what they were going to look at or how many pieces that we needed. And so we were cutting out uh, little paper sets and, and moving the pieces around. And it was just a small, uh, like two inch tall uh, cutouts that we would bend the bottom so that they would stand up and put pennies on them. And, to help uh, hold them in place while we then moved them around and Tim figured out, you know, 
if we do a couple of windows and one door and we put them in this configuration, we could get this room. And so that was kind of the, the initial planning was just a very simple and cheap way of experimentation. And then I made some nicer sets. If you remember, I came with little mock-ups of each room that were actually printed out of what a window would look like. We came up with what was the minimal number of walls we needed to be in the number of rooms and sets. And it came to be like, I think 16, like four windows, some walls, two doors, and we just moved them around um, each during the week to become the room that we needed to be. I remember that first day on the big set, we had to turn the great hall, take it all apart, and turn it into a night scene for the lunchbox of secrets, uh, finding and relight it. And I, I just remember that tr our crew was so amazing; they just transformed, you know, those hallways into those hallways just without me even really having to do much. You know, it's just like we needed to be this with a window and this and this, and they just went went to it. Um, that was another late night. Um, those, those were, were long, long days. days. I mean, yeah. these were short days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd get there at 7 or 8 in the morning, and you'd be there maybe till midnight uh, if you were lucky shooting stuff. Uh, we have uh, one more uh, question, and then we're uh, going to wrap up the uh, audience questions. Uh, is there anything that didn't make it on the, in the final cut? Any scene that uh, you're disappointed that ended up not uh, being in the final version yes. of the film? I'll say cut it, cut my monologue right out. <laughs> so, but I wanted to remember at the end when uh, Rose, you're thrown into the romance novel. Oh, oh yeah. And I actually wanted us to shoot a scene with you with Fabio, not the you that Fabio, <laughs> you know, blonde, you know, muscle rubbers <laughs> thing. Bobby on a horse, and I, I was dying to have that, that scene. <laughs> and yeah, just, no, I that. I, yeah. I thought I would have been afraid. I with Michael. <laughs> I don't think we cut any other scenes. In fact, as Brian will know, we were we were adding scenes. Yeah. <laughs> the entire trailer Ronnie scene was shot in my corner on a green screen. <laughs> Uh, that whole classroom full of people on ninety percent of it's Andy, yeah. one of our uh, effects artists. Um, and I remember Brian's like, "More scenes!" I get to say, more. Because <laughs> <laughs> Brian wasn't there to do the audio, so he's like, "Oh God, what's this?" Tim, what's your favorite thing you came up with in post? Like, what's your favorite moment that someone just created in post? Uh, well, I think that scene actually was sort of a challenge of like, hey, let's get trailer. I just knew Joe was going to be, it was a year later, and I knew Joe was going to be in town, and his hair was just about the right length. Not quite, but I'm like, hey, what do we do the scene with the trailer on scene and you there? And I wrote up this little scene and storyboarded it. My idea was you shoot Joe by himself, pretending Bryce is there. You see Bryce by himself. You shoot the teacher by himself. All the... And then, you know, literally just having the background be like Lego windows and computer uh, hard drives and bits of fabric and like, hey, here's a, one of the big scenes of the movie shot in one corner with no one there at the same time. Um, it was a lot of fun, kind of a challenge. But I, I think just bringing everything else to live, uh, you know, alive um, through the, you know, luckily we didn't have as much green screen as we did in Door to the Rings, which was good. Um, but there was still quite a bit of little things uh, to, 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 you know, touch up and things you wouldn't even think about or notice, like scenes where I'm like, hey, this window is kind of blah looking, it doesn't look nice bright blue, so adding like blue to rotoscoping and getting masking and making it pop a little bit more, something you would just take for granted, um, just little stuff like that that just really helped enhance the movie. The one thing I can never get out of my head is the bad time Mooney scene with Steve Bailey's face or reaction to being scolded. I can never get that. I can never get that image out of my mind. It was just so perfect. I'm not looking at anybody else around. I'm just looking at Steve's face. <laughs> uh, well, guys, uh, thank you, everyone, that was uh, in here to... Uh, to talk to us and to, wa to watch this uh, this Q and A, and uh, before we uh, 
we end the stream and the q and I know that Kieran has a project that you would like to uh, talk about. Uh, he has a short film that he that he did. Uh, what I've done is that I wrote a poem about what's happening uh, at the moment, and that uh, the poem is called Unity. It's about that we should get together to fight Corona 19. And go, you know, I wrote that poem and it got picked up and it was like, hey, can we get some uh, CFX people that I've been working with? Uh, each one to do a couple of French aids. And got got them all together. Uh, we filmed ourselves because we were all in isolation, but we had to do it in our house. You know, but everybody's, you know, doing their own thing. And uh, I had to sit down and crack. This person is going to do these two lines or that two lines and forever. And we did that, got them uh, filmed on our mobile and sent it to uh, Simon, who was going to put it all together. And, you know, he was the director who was going to put it together and do everything else. And I think it, uh, we did it in a week, basically. Once we got all the lines together, done that, we got that done, and we put it together uh, in one week. It's out on our social media, and it's all about this thing. And the thing is that I am supporting a hospital over here called Great Ormond Street Hospital. It's only for children, and uh, yeah, everything that, that, uh, that people donate for this thing. The hundred percent of that is going to that hospital. So that was my project, and it just came out when was it on Friday, I think. Friday, yeah. Friday. Yeah, and it's done really well. I'm proud of that. How do we find access to that, Karen? What's that? How do we get access to that? Do you have a? Uh, if you go on my Twitter, it'll okay. come. Or if you, you know. Oh, oh. Got it right here for you guys. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I have the, the video here and I'm uh, gonna show the audience as soon as we finish the Q&A. So uh, if you guys uh, uh, can yeah. help out, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, great. Yeah, definitely. You can go onto my Twitter, Facebook page, uh, YouTube, you can get it. It's all there in social media. Beautiful. Yeah. Once again, uh, thanks everyone for uh, for watching and being here, especially you guys for uh, talking uh, talking uh, about this film and the 10 year anniversary. Uh, it's been great being here and uh, I feel like I know you guys uh, even more now and uh, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Together, to be as one. To help each other. You cover my back. I will cover your back. If we do this, then we will all survive this so-called pandemic. We've got to pull together. All our resources. Embrace this new day. As one, we fight an invisible enemy. If we let it be, then it will destroy us all. So to be one like him will strengthen our position. And soon we will overcome this enemy and united we will have to be. Forever looking out for an invisible enemy. That should never be.